thank you very much for inviting me. Um, so yes, so I'm the chair of the Interfaith Council and we're, we are in a really fortunate position here in Wales that we're, because we're a small country and we're close to the, the Welsh Assembly, um, after 9-11, they set up a faith forum, which meant that various members of the council also get to sit on the faith forum as well. And uh, now this meetings used to take place probably about every three months. And um, I mean, they were, they were very interesting. But what I found remarkable, actually, during COVID-19 is how we've become they clearly view us as much more useful, and I find the whole process much more useful since COVID-19. Um, because it, it quite often happens in the past, because there's a big gap between the meetings, that you, you have to go and read your notes up and remember what had happened last time round. Whereas right really from the very beginning of COVID-19, we were having monthly meetings with the minister and um, tackling issues, well, primary issues at the beginning obviously were phasing out, closing down all our places of worship and then how were we going to reopen them, making sure there was proper consultation and there was a proper task group set up that were working very closely with the minister uh, on setting up the regulations in Wales. Um, obviously about how to deal with funerals and weddings and um, how these phased reopening should happen. More recently, um, we've been talking about the vaccines. I, mean, I was very impressed with your lovely vaccine um, video. We've actually done, the, our Muslim community have actually invited all the faith leaders to put together, and that's just about finished now, to do a, a, a video on encouraging everybody from different faiths to take the vaccine. But I know the government have been really, really pleased that that, that has been able to take place. And our evangelical group put on a really excellent workshop um, just dealing with all the questions and reasons why people might not want to take the vaccine, again, opened up to everybody. And I know, again, that the government have been thrilled with that. Um, part of what's also happened here is that um, a lot of the, because there's been this close working together with government, um, the various faiths have been wanting to be involved in opening up their places of worship for the vaccine centres so that people can come in and, and feel confident that their leaders are saying this is a good thing to do. Um, just to show you how successful I think it's, it's been, at our very recent meeting, so we have elections here for the Welsh Assembly in May, and uh, so we had our last of the, the forum meetings before the election uh, about a week ago, and the faith minister, who's the deputy minister, um, she got all emotional when she was talking to us about, she just wanted to say thank you for how great the support had been from the faith community in terms of, you know, assisting with these regulations and supporting. But it was a two-way process. It wasn't just us assisting them. They were also consulting with us and making sure they didn't do things that would be, um, you know, that people would be unhappy with. So for example, in this last meeting, they were discussing whether people should be allowed to stand in on the streets um, as the funeral um, car went by. And earlier regulations hadn't said anything about it. So that is what happens here in Wales, is that people, if they wanted to, would stand outside on the streets. And so there was a discussion about from the, the health minister as to whether that should actually be happening and whether we should be stopping that. And so the faith community was like, well, I think that might not go down very well, given that you have been allowing it. And hopefully things are getting better now because, you know, more people are getting vaccinated and so on. And the government took it on board and they didn't change it. So it was really a two way process. And I think it's I think it's been so great. Um, I've certainly felt very privileged, actually, to be a part of that process. And I. I know we're lucky here in Wales that the government have to consult with us. Um, but I think during the last 12 months, it's not just been an, oblig you know, an obligation that they've got to consult with us. I think they've actually wanted to consult with us, which I've found really, really heartening. Um, and I think they've recognised that we have an awful lot to provide in terms of um, volunteering, 
uh, I think, I can't remember if Daniel has mentioned about the emotional and spiritual support that's just been so vital during this bleak time. And I felt like we were a real partner as opposed to because they've got to. And I hope that that will continue going forward. That's probably all I need to say. Great, if that's okay. that's brilliant. Thank you, Katie. That's, that's, that's absolutely great and so encouraging. Um, great to hear that, you know, fruit of that really good relationship and how it's worked out to benefit people of all sorts. Um, again, we do have um, a few minutes for um, questions or comments. Um, if you'd like to raise a digital hand, um, I'll be very happy to uh, facilitate a few people making their contributions. Waiting but if we've got a few minutes and nobody has asked a question, I might just mention one other thing. Just about it was, um, I mean, one of the things that so we're also lucky in Wales that we also get to sit on um, as council members on the the government portfolios, and they they get changed every so often when the ministers get moved around. But um, so one of the discussions that I was involved in recently was about housing and homelessness, and you know during the pandemic there has been very little in the way of homelessness that somehow beds have been found. And so we were just having a discussion about how, how why shouldn't that continue going forward? You know, if we've managed to, to deal with it during the pandemic, why can't we deal with it going forward? And again, I found that actually a really useful discussion. Great. We do now have a, a contribution, Jim, Jim Robertson. You're muted at the moment. <coughs> yes, a <coughs> slightly different question here. I wonder whether the faith groups uh, could speak much more uh, consistently with their members who actually work in public services, both the local authority and the civil service. And I think we, you know, with the systemic kind of concerns we have in society, people are having to make decisions every day in their work roles that often they know are against the common good. So how does a church speak with people, you know, with their members who actually work in these public contexts, who daily, mm -hmm. in every role, uh, know or feel that they're making decisions against the common good? And therefore we end up with the systemic inequalities mm -hmm. which we have observed through the pandemic perhaps more so than others, particularly in the social care world. So how, how would the speakers view that in terms of the church speaking with the members? Now, there's a challenging question. I don't think, Katie, you should be sole re solely responsible for No, 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 I think that's a bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, did, but did you have any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I suppose my thoughts are, in, in the council that I'm involved in, we have the heads of the various um, faiths come to that meeting. And I would hope that they would be representative and have taken the views from their membership, um, particularly those that are involved on the front line. I do think that's really, really important. Um, I suppose it's a two way process, isn't it? It's from the ground up and also from the top down seeking views from below, but also um, those that are involved on the front line, maybe they should be feeding their views up so that they get heard. 